When I first started posting to this channel, now a little over seven years ago, my mission statement was an educational one. I wanted to make the process of learning and understanding brass instruments quicker and easier for a young audience. This was, for 14-year-old Sam, a lofty goal. He had just graduated middle school, had been playing the trumpet for a little under four years, and needless to say, had very little sage wisdom of any sort to offer to the greater community. But seven years later, I would like to revisit that exact mission statement. As part of my senior project for Gonzaga University's Honors Program, I would like to start a six-part video series on the channel, that's four fundamental episodes and two comprehensive ones, about the science of this thing, the trumpet less so about how to play the trumpet, and more so about how it's made and designed and what sort of factors go into the manufacturing of what you see here before you, as that's ironically a subject I'm a little bit more qualified to talk about. I may not have a degree in music performance, and I may not be a competition-winning level trumpet player, but I am two things. A, a mechanical engineering major, and B, a massive nerd. So today, once again, I'd like to talk to you about this thing, and more specifically, this thing. The trumpet mouthpiece. So without any further dilly-dallying, let's begin Trumpet Demystified, a new venture on the Samuel Plays Brass YouTube channel. Playing the trumpet is hard work. At least for me it is. If you don't feel that way, then in equal parts I both applaud and envy you. But for the rest of us mere mortals who struggle with a myriad of issues while playing, it's important to keep in mind one key piece of information. It is better to work smarter than it is to work harder. By knowing ourselves, and knowing what's on the market in terms of different trumpets and mouthpieces that are available to us, we can make wise choices that will mitigate the amount of hard work we have to do on the instrument once we reach a certain level of playing. I like to start with mouthpieces specifically because they're the first piece of the apparatus that we interact with as trumpet players while playing the instrument, and they're also the easiest and cheapest to manipulate. So here are two examples of trumpet mouthpieces from my vast collection. To the unassuming onlooker, they might look rather similar. They're both hunks of metal, about yay long, yay wide at the top, maybe yay wide at the bottom. So why does it matter which one of these you use? Let's just say there's a reason that this is the mouthpiece I've used for most of my playing for the past six years, which is more than half the time I've spent playing the trumpet, and this is one I wouldn't feel comfortable using in any setting for any amount of time. As it turns out, varying any number of probably 10 different parameters on a trumpet mouthpiece on the basis of a thousandth of an inch or a percent of a millimeter can make a vast difference, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We'll now dive into a discussion of several different parameters of the trumpet mouthpiece, how those parameters can be changed or varied, and how changing those parameters will affect the sound or playing experience of the trumpet. Just a general warning, it's going to get extremely nerdy moving forward. Our first topic of discussion is going to be the mouthpiece rim, or the metal surface that actually touches your lips as you play. This surface has a huge impact on how your mouthpiece plays and feels to play. Firstly, the width of the rim surface. If you play a mouthpiece with a narrower rim, as in less metal touching your face at any given time, you might find that you have clearer articulations, that's the attack or the front of your notes, and greater flexibility of pitch, as in it's easier to transition from low notes to high notes and vice versa. However, if you play a mouthpiece with a wider rim surface, you'll likely find playing more comfortable and you might find that you have more endurance over a long period of time than with a narrower rim at the cost of some of that flexibility we discussed with the narrow rim. You'll notice that's a trade-off. That's going to be a very common theme in this video. Everything about mouthpiece design is a trade-off, and that's the reason why this mouthpiece exists, and this mouthpiece exists, and all of those mouthpieces exist on the modern market. Every player prefers a different set of trade-offs and therefore a subtly different mouthpiece. Now the shape or the contour of a mouthpiece rim can have just as much bearing on how it plays as the width, but unfortunately it is a much messier topic to discuss. There isn't just one linear spectrum between narrow and wide here, and so the best I can really do is throw out a few adjectives for your enjoyment and hopefully some level of basic understanding. A lot of trumpet mouthpieces have some amount of curvature or roundness to the rim. A round, gentle, curved rim is generally a good compromise. It's comfortable for most players and it balances all characteristics of playing reasonably well. There are different things we can do to the roundness of that rim. If we flatten the rim surface, we get some of the characteristics of the wider rims, and we also have a more compact feel as it's more squared into the inside of the mouthpiece rather than a gentle bend inward. If we sharpen the rim of the mouthpiece, we tend to get more of the narrower rim type characteristics, and we tend to have a roomier feel in the mouthpiece at the cost of generally some of the comfort while playing. 
There are more niche rims out there, such as asymmetrical or parabolic ones, or rims with an inward contour, but again, those are niche for a reason. They're generally not the place to start looking, and they tend to be more specialized for players who have very particular sets of lips. Now, with what we're about to talk about here, there is some amount of debate as to whether it fits better into the previous or following chapters of this video. I personally like to completely separate it from either. I don't find it fits into discussions of either very cleanly or relevantly. I think it's its own thing and probably the single most important factor in determining whether a trumpet mouthpiece, in heavy quotations, works for you. Take a look at my mouthpiece. The outline of this rim surface here is, shocker, a circle. That's the case for 99 plus percent of trumpet mouthpieces. Now, this inner surface here, also a circle. Now think back to geometry class. Circles have diameters. That's what happens when you measure from one opposing wall to the other. That farthest distance there is referred to as the diameter. For the inner surface here, shockingly enough, that's referred to as the inner diameter of the mouthpiece. And this is one of those factors that varying by a few thousandths of an inch can drastically change the feel and sound of your mouthpiece. While it's pretty clear just from a surface level discussion that the rim surface of a mouthpiece interfaces with your lips about here and here, it's also important to note that the inner diameter interfaces with an even more important part of your lips, and that's what's in between. The center of your lips is what does the vibration to produce the sound on the instrument. A smaller inner diameter allows for less vibration, and a wider inner diameter allows for a little bit more of your lip surface to vibrate. This is hugely dependent for most players on the size and thickness and texture of their lips. If you have thicker and fleshier lips, you might do better on a wider inner diameter that allows for more vibration to occur so that your lips aren't clamped down where there's almost no space left for them to vibrate. Whereas if you have thinner, weaker, or softer lips, you might find that you do a little bit better on smaller inner diameters. This is extremely important to know as a player. Now have a listen to this very rudimentary demonstration of a wider versus narrower inner diameter and take note of the differences that you hear. Again, very rudimentary, and the difference you saw there is vastly overblown. Most trumpet mouthpieces have almost visually indiscernible differences in inner diameter. And so what I did there is completely exaggerated, but the point still stands. With a narrower inner diameter, the string that is your lips is a little bit more taut, and there's less room for vibration to occur, and vice versa with a wider inner diameter. And therein lies the question of whether smaller inner diameters make it easier to play higher notes, which trumpet players love to do. And there is some evidence that indicates yes, especially for a certain subset of players, but the most important thing is knowing the size and shape of your lips. As someone with a lot of flesh on their lower lip, I find that I make much less of a compromise playing larger inner diameters, regardless of low notes, high notes, or anything in between. Whereas if I play too small of an inner diameter, my lips feel extremely cramped and not capable of enough vibration to produce the full range of notes. And now we're at the point of talking about the cup of the mouthpiece, or this inner section here where you'll notice the walls slope inward until they reach this hole, or the point of greatest resistance, which will be the next chapter. The cup section can once again be varied in a couple different ways. Firstly, the depth, or essentially how much of your fingernail you can still see when you put your finger inside the cup section of the mouthpiece. Most brands will agree on a standard depth, within a few thousandths of an inch at least, where if you go shallower than that standard depth, your tone will have more high frequencies to it. It'll be a brighter, crisper sort of tone that carries better in a large hall. You might find that you also have better endurance or better attacks or articulations on a shallower cup, Whereas, on the flip side of that coin, if you go deeper than the standard depth, you'll find that your tone, correspondingly, becomes deeper and richer and warmer. It has more low or middle frequencies in the sound that tend to be more agreeable with smaller audiences in smaller spaces, if that's the sort of work you do. Although, if you push the mouthpiece, it still can fill up a large hall, just with a deeper and uh, less harsh sound than a shallower mouthpiece. Now, you might find that you have worse endurance or worse attacks on a deeper cup in contrast to the shallower cup. I think a lot of players feel that way, whereas I belong to a rather small subset of players that actually does best and feels most comfortable on a cup that is slightly deeper than normal. Now, the shape of the cup matters just as much as the actual depth. There are two main shapes that trumpet mouthpieces can take in terms of the cup. Firstly, we have a U shape, which is fairly standard, and a V shape, which is fairly specialized. Now watch closely. The U cup has a little bit more internal volume than its V counterpart. The U cup, like I said, is more standard, and it tends to have a nice compromise, a more wide and broad sort of tone with a little bit less definition to it, whereas a V cup of the same depth has less volume and is a very efficient mouthpiece. You can imagine it's literally funneling the air into the mouthpiece more effectively than a U shape would. And so you have a more direct sense of tone and attacks, although it can really cause a brighter sound. 
these two factors of the cup kind of work together and influence each other. So whether you have a deep V or a shallow U, or you mix those around and create four different combinations to varying extents, you have a wide range of different internal volumes to the cup. And it is best to land as close to the middle, in my opinion, as you can for most of your playing. Now what's evidenced by that graph and is very important to realize is that there isn't just the perfect U and perfect V shape. There is an entire spectrum that exists in between, and almost no trumpet mouthpiece is exactly one or the other. Most mid-range trumpet mouthpieces tend to have a little bit of both. The cup might slope down in more of a U shape at first, and then might have sides that look like a V, where it slopes in pretty quickly, and then the bottom of the cup might also, once again, be a little bit more U-shaped. There are a huge amount of different combinations and points on the spectrum that you can take advantage of for your preferred compromise of crispness versus breadth of tone. Now, I mentioned the point of greatest resistance in the mouthpiece, and indeed the entire trumpet apparatus, and that is that small hole you see there at the bottom of the cup section. That is what we refer to as the throat or the bore of the mouthpiece, and it alone regulates how much air goes into the trumpet. It does not matter after a certain point how hard or how much air you blow down the tube. There is only so much that will fit into that hole there. Throat size is not something that every trumpet player does or necessarily even should mess with, but it is worthy of discussion, because you can vary that size to some extent, although it's almost imperceptible to the naked eye. Trumpet mouthpiece throat sizes are standardized by the U.S. drill chart, which you'll see a small section of here. The U.S. drill chart has numeric sizes that correspond to certain amounts of inches or millimeters. A strange quirk of it is that the sizing is unfortunately not consistent. There isn't a consistent difference in sizes, but, you know, we work with it in whatever respect that we can. Trumpet mouthpiece throats tend to fall within a fairly small range on the drill chart of numbers like... 35 down to maybe 14, maybe 10 or 12, although I haven't really seen that before, where a smaller number means a wider throat diameter. Now, probably 95% of mouthpieces fall within the range of 24 to 28 on the drill chart, and probably 80 to 90 fall within 26 or 27. That is very much the standard. That 27 or 0.144 inches very much your typical middle of the road. Now this begs the question of why we don't all use huge, massive, quarter of an inch type throats. And that's a fair question because supposedly we should be able to make a bigger sound with a bigger throat because we can use more air. But on the same token, you have to use more air. And that tires you out a lot quicker, at least in the case of most players. Me personally, I can get really gassed if I play on a throat much larger than a 26 for too long. Now something that I really like to talk about that sadly gets overlooked a lot of the time but can have one heck of an impact on your mouthpiece is not the size of the throat so much as the shape of it. And what I mean by that is depending on whether the transition from cup to throat is more squared off as in it forms a corner or more rounded as in it's a little bit smoother all the way through, that can really change the personality, if you will, of your mouthpiece. A more squared off throat entrance provides a cleaner sound that's more consistent through the dynamics and it allows for slightly firmer and more consistent articulations to the tone, but if you round it out, you tend to have slightly easier response with the instrument. I mean, the airflow might look a little bit more aerodynamic in that case, and it does feel as though it takes less energy or less push to get the notes started. And at soft dynamics, you get a really interesting tonal effect where your tone becomes more whispery or fluffy, perhaps. You can listen to players like Miles Davis or Chet Baker or Roy Hargrove if you want to hear that type of sound. That's the quintessential fluffy sound in jazz, and it's one that I really like to capitalize on, if I can, based on my mouthpiece choice. So we've talked about the cup section of the mouthpiece where the air enters and is tapered inward. We've talked about the throat, which is that point of greatest resistance, which regulates the air. Now what about all the rest of this length here, where the walls of the mouthpiece taper outward ever so slightly? That's what we refer to as the backbore of the trumpet mouthpiece. Now backbores are a hairy subject, not least of which because it's tough to visually discern anything. I mean, have a look in there and tell me if you can tell me anything meaningful about this mouthpiece's backbore. There's very little I could tell you just by looking. And additionally, there are a number of factors to a backbore that make it hard to talk about, even if you were to cut the mouthpiece open and take a look at the cross section. But there are a couple of guiding principles that can at least help us here. First of all, the more volume of empty space you have in a backboard, the more volume or depth of tone you're going to have. And there are a couple of ways we can accomplish it. First, that taper from throat to mouthpiece opening. If the taper looks like this, that might be reasonably standard, and there's a certain amount of volume you get from that. If the taper looks like this, it's a little bit tighter. And if the taper looks like that and occurs very quickly in a short span of time, then it's a little bit more open. Then there's also the actual width of the opening, which you can tell based on sort of the skin thickness here of the metal. Every trumpet mouthpiece will have basically the same width, 
right here. And that's so that it inserts properly into the instrument. But if you see a thicker skin here, that means there's less width to the backboard or a more concentrated tone. Whereas if the skin is thinner, then the backboard has a little bit more volume at the end and will produce a wider, more spread sort of tone. Typically, if you're doing a lot of high register playing that desires a bright sound, then you want a fairly tight backboard to concentrate the sound for you. Whereas if you're doing a lot of symphonic playing or you're playing a lot of very low notes, you're going to tend to want a more open backboard for, once again, a more open sound, even if that doesn't directly influence the amount of air going through the throat. And there are also a couple of external factors of the trumpet mouthpiece's blank, as we call it, that we can talk about and manipulate for different effects. Firstly, the length of the total blank. Most trumpet mouthpieces are about three and a half inches long, but if you shorten the blank, especially your high notes, but generally all of the notes will be raised in pitch. And so depending on the intonation characteristics of the instrument, if your high notes are especially flat, you might look at a mouthpiece that is shorter overall in length, even though it has all of the same tapers. You can also vary the weight of the mouthpiece, which is probably, if anything, what you saw as the difference between these two. This is lighter weight, this is heavier weight. I don't want to get too far into what that does, because we're going to have a whole episode of Trumpet Demystified dedicated to weights of trumpets and mouthpieces, and that'll go into a whole lot more depth. But essentially, the more mass you have, and the more that mass is concentrated towards the bottom, the less energy is lost going into the instrument. And you'll have to stay tuned if you want to hear the playing consequences of that. So I think my first lecture has dragged on for a decent while, but hopefully our discussion has clarified for you what all of the different parameters you can vary with this silly little piece of metal can do for your playing. And I know we didn't fully answer the question of how to choose the ideal mouthpiece for you and your playing, but just to spoil things a little bit more, that's a strength of mine telling what sort of mouthpiece will work well for what sort of player. And that I've dedicated an entire comprehensive episode to. As a reminder, that's episodes five and six of this series. So stay tuned for that if you want a little bit of help in diagnosing what sort of a player you are. And based on that and what sort of music you play, what sort of mouthpiece might benefit you and where to find that sort of mouthpiece. And for now, that'll conclude episode one of Trumpet Demystified with your host, Sam. Thank you so much for your time and stay tuned for episode two coming very soon.